through on time, relax, and we will celebrate the Lord's Supper in just a few minutes. Acts 27 is one of the most dramatic maritime adventures ever seen. And we have a fantastic book written about it. We're gonna study it in God's word, but God has given us another resource that a fellow by the name of James Smith 150 years ago who researched this. He was a, um, uh, an experienced mariner himself, a Christian, a scholar, and he went through this very voyage. He studied this for 20 years, and he wrote a book, The Voyage and Shipwreck of St. Paul, written in 1848. You can still get it on Amazon. I just ordered it. It'll be here uh, in paperback in next week. 35 bucks for paperback. It's an old book. I guess it's valuable. But I'm going to show you some amazing things how perfect God's Word is. We know it's perfect. We know it's His Word. We know that it is all has all authority and has no errors. We know God's Word and we trust it. But we're going to see an exciting story here. I'm going to just gloss over. I'm going to speak about the first few verses, and then we're going to read the last few verses of this first section. But in, as we start in, in, in chapter 20, the whole chapter 27, in the first few verses there, you'll notice that in verse 1 that we should sail. We're in the we narrative again. The we narrative what we left in, in chapter 21 of Acts, and you remember that's Luke being with Paul. And you may not have recognized this, but Luke is with Paul through this perilous journey. He is an eyewitness, and his exact documentation, as we will find out, is borne out in the reality of the research that has been done that shows the exact path, the exact shoal, the exact place, and the exact time. All of this is accurate. And that's what amazed me about this uh, this research. We know it's true, but it is true to every detail, every detail. Paul had been in prison, as you know, and now it's time for him to leave. The, uh, the uh, Festus now puts him on a ship and he is leaving with, a, with some other prisoners and Roman guards and they leave from the port in, near, in Caesarea and go up the coast and uh, sail around Cyprus. And I'm going to show you the map again for a second. So Caesarea, they leave and they uh, are sailing. And notice how this is the yellow line. This is what we're going to be following today. Notice Instead of going straight over, they have to go around Cyprus. Why is that, you might say? Why is that? The research is done that in the book I just mentioned. This is summertime. The winds are coming from the west. So you, the ships can only sail in the old days uh, with the wind. So they hide behind this uh, Cyprus. And that's why I sail that way. Very interesting. Over to Myra. And then um, the reason he sailed to Myra is directly above Alexandria. And this is going to come into play um, right now. As they got to Myra, Myra is just north of Alexandria, and they get on a big grain ship from Egypt. I didn't realize this until researching, but grain and food is important if you're going to run an empire and so they had big vessels that they chartered, basically, that ran from Alexandria in Egypt where they brought rice, they brought wheat, and they shipped it. They went up for the winds I just showed you up to Myra, and then they would sh go around uh, the tip of Italy uh, to the port of Puteoli, and bring the food into Rome where it was distributed throughout 
their empire. Without food, empires fail. This was mission critical. And so this was a, a very smooth operation. And this is what was this is what Paul is now going to ride because they find a ship uh, from Alexandria, uh, a centurion, uh, Julius, and he is from a fancy Augustan uh, cohort, meaning it was a very a uh, notable group of guards that he, he, he was the commander of. And Julius really liked Paul. So Julius found this ship. And as a centurion, Julius became the commander of the ship. So he brought aboard his prisoners and all together about 276 people. And they got on this big ship. I want to show a picture of the ship. And this is interesting. Sorry, just bear with me. I'm going to go frank on you here. We're, we're really uh, we're going to dig in here. This is a ship. I mean, that's not a bad looking ship. 276 men is a big, big ship. You, um, notice these um, little look like oars. Those are the rudders. There's one on each side. We'll see soon how they're going to tie them up and lash them up here because they're not going to be able to guide. Here's the mainsail. They're going to be losing this great big beam here in a minute. And then this is the foresail that the, that'll come into play at the very end. But this is a big ship filled with grain, rice, and almost 300 men. That's good, thanks. Now, we're gonna pick this up as we go back to the map one more time, and I'm gonna leave the map alone after this. Focus, and then we're done. So they leave Myra, and they have to kind of go up the coast of Nidus uh, here. It took them forever. I told you the winds are coming from the west. And see, they're going against the wind. They're trying to sneak around and get some little breezes off the shore. And there's a current, a current that goes this way around the Mediterranean. So they're riding this current, and they finally make it here. But this is important. It took them a lot of extra time. And again, you see they had to sail this side of Crete over here, away from the winds, and they come here to Fair Haven, all right? And this is going to be the big issue we're going to start with. And there's another port right where my marker is uh, that's called Phoenix. From there to there, that's where the big bosses wanted to stay. And we're going to see that fateful decision um, in just a second. But as we pick up now, in verse 9 through 12, much time had passed, I just mentioned. The voyage was now dangerous because even the, fest, the fast was over. Paul advised them, saying, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only to the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship than to what Paul said. And because the harbor was not suitable to spend the winter in, Fair Haven, the majority decided to put out to sea from there on the chance, notice the word chance, that somehow they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete facing southwest and northwest and spend the winter there. So, they wanted to move about 60 miles. You saw where I pointed on the map, 60 miles to the west on Crete to a larger harbor that was safer. Fair Haven, where they were, would get a lot of easterly winds because in the stormy season, the winds switch. They get nor'easters, and that comes around counterclockwise. So it's an east wind. And so Fair Haven was exposed to the east wind. They wanted to move around about 60 miles to a safer harbor. Paul said no. He senses great danger. This dangerous time to sail was about September 11th to November 11th. Um, <clears throat> those months, sailors would try to sail in the Mediterranean at great risk. 
The research done in that book shows this year in 59 AD, the, the, uh, the feast was the Feast of Atonement. And that was on October the 9th. And this had passed. So they were probably in the middle of October. So you can see September 11th to November 11th is danger. After November 11th, no one sailed until the end of February. You die. If you go to sail on the Mediterranean after the 11th of November, you're dead. So nobody sailed then. So here they are, mid-October. Here's the danger season. They're already on the edge of it. And they say, oh, it's just 60 miles. We're going to be able to make it. And Paul said no. Have you ever had a bad feeling about something? Have you ever had something in you say, hey, we better not do this? Or something kind of warning you? Have you ever had such a sensation? Now, my wife's not here. I love it because I can really go full board. I'm going to, but this is a good story. Um, Mothers have an intuition. There's no question about that. We don't know how we can explain that. How do moms know what's going on? Well, she's a mom of four now. I'm well, I mean, this is when we were younger. Our uh, third child was upstairs playing, and Kathy was downstairs, and he was in his bedroom, and it was quiet. Now, what happens when your child's playing and it's quiet? Okay, so maybe that is not women's intuitions. That's common sense. You remember that. When your child's quiet, you better be looking. She went upstairs. She opened the door. He was three years old, okay? And she saw him, the window open, legs hanging out. He was sitting on the edge of the windowsill, about 20 feet from the ground, I mean, up off the ground. She didn't scream. God gave her wisdom and self-control. Because if she just screamed, what would have happened? Um, so she walked quietly and just gently put her arms around Jeff, holding back in, heart racing. And she then just said, well, Jeff, Jeffrey, that was his name then, he's Jeff now. Jeffrey, what were you doing? And here's his, re- his what did you want to do, Jeffrey? And he replied, I wanted to fly. Okay, this is our son that had no fear. I mean, I won't get into all the details, but he's crazy. He's absolutely crazy. And he is also our son who lives in Atlanta, who's a captain for Delta Airlines, and he's flying all the time. So, but he had seen a Superman movie, and he thought he was going to jump out and fly. And he, I don't know if he would have. He probably would have. But Kathy felt that and had this sense, something's wrong. And she went up there and thankfully nothing happened. So what is your experience? What is that little gut-wrenching feeling that you've had? That something's not right. Something's wrong. How did you react to that? Did you follow that instinct? And did that help you get out of that situation? Or did you ignore it and say, man, I wish I would have listened to that spirit in me telling me I should intervene. There, God can speak to us through his spirit. I think even, in, in, and probably spoke to Kathy in that way through the Holy Spirit. But God is there. And no matter what danger is lurking, no matter what you fear, he is there. And sometimes he is warning you. We've seen that in Paul where he and Jesus both were warned, don't go back to Jerusalem, don't go to Jerusalem. And so that's God warning them. But he is They go to Jerusalem, but he is preparing them. They are getting mentally ready to go and into the fire for the Lord. So they didn't listen, and they started sailing. I'm going to read verses 13 through 26. Bear with me. A little south wind came up, and that helped them get around that corner to go to Phoenix. They thought they could make it. 
As soon as they got around the corner, you saw that corner. A, there's a big mountain on Crete, right in the middle of Crete. And there was a nor'easter and it blew over and the, and the wind came down that mountain and just rushed out into the sea. And they, a tempest, they called it a tempestuous wind, the nor'easter, northeaster, struck down from the land. And when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along. This is just like a hurricane. Uh, cycl it's a, the, the Greek word means a cyclone. So it's a hurricane. And running under the lee, uh, the, the safe side of a small island, Cauda, we managed with difficulty to secure the ship's boat. After hoisting it up, uh, they used supports to undergird the ship. Then fearing that they would run aground in Sirtis, they lowered the gear and thus they were driven along. Since they were violently storm-tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard. That includes the big mast with their own hands. Neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest lay on us all. All hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them. Paul, right here, is human. I told you so. I mean, no, he didn't say quite that. But that's what he said. I told you so. You should have listened to me. And not have set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Yet now I urge you to take heart. For there will be no loss of life among you, but only the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of the God to whom I belong and with whom I worship. And he said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar and behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told, but we must run aground on some island. Told you so, but take heart. One more map just for a second. Sorry, I lied to you. So they went around the corner there, bam, they got smashed. And they were pulled all the way across. They were afraid. Uh, Sirtis that they're talking about is in Tunisia here. Because you see, boom, that's where they thought they were going. There were all sorts of sands, it's called quicksands out here, that would mire down a ship away from the shore and you, could, and you would drown. So you see, boom, that's where they thought they were going to go, but they ended up on an island, Malta. Um, so all hope was lost, because let me ask you this question. Been in a hurricane? I have. Grew up in Norfolk, been through a few of them. Is it dark? Mm -hmm. Do you see the sky? Do you see the, the stars? Do you see the sun? Do you see the moon? No. How did ships get their guidance? Did they have, um, did they have ways? Did they have ways on their ships? Did they even have a compass? No, wasn't invented. They were guided by the stars and the sun. So they had no idea where they were. They knew they were just getting blown and they thought they were going to end up in, on North Africa in this quicksand. And, be, and, and that's why they said they have, they abandoned all hope, but God reached out. He told them, take heart. And Jesus tells us the same words, you know, in this world, you will have trials, you will have tribulations. But what does he say? Take heart. I have overcome the world. God is saying the same thing to these unbelieving men through his servant, Paul. And he's saying to them, not one of you will die. Not one of you will die. Take hope. Yeah, everything's going to be lost. This ship's going to be crashed. We're going to crash into some island. But you are going to live because my God said so. And in this time of hopelessness, we see God saving us. 
Now, the interesting thing you may not have noticed, 276 men are going to be saved. But yet there's only a few of them that are Christian, right? Two, maybe three or four people with Paul, Luke being one of them. Human society has no idea how much it owes by the mercy of God to the presence in this society of righteous people. The righteousness of Paul, who was serving the Lord, saved the lives of 276 people. And in just a minute, I'm going to show how that happened fairly recently. Because God works through his servants. And people around you can be saved just like Paul saved 276 lives. God is faithful. He will lead you, even in fearful times. God will act in this world, and he will save people in this world. He will save their lives, and they don't even know him. That's an amazing truth, an amazing truth. The very end of this is also interesting. I showed you where they were blown by this hurricane. And this gentleman Smith took his boat 150 years ago. He was a sailboat. He studied it. He asked all the, the, the fishermen that worked on Crete how they handle these storms and how fast their boats would go because they put a sea anchor out. They lowered down the gear, called a sea anchor, and a boat will travel at 1.5 miles an hour. The, the exact mileage from <clears throat> uh, this little island, Clauda, where they were able to fasten up their ship and lower ropes underneath it to gird it up and get rid of the mast is 476 miles away. And so how long would it take to get to Malta? 13 days, one hour, and 27 minutes to the dot. That's where they got, and they anchored, and then went on in the next morning. So literally, this is exactly true. And then he further, Smith, he further, he found this <clears throat> sandbar, and it had sand at the beginning, but then as it got uh, closer to the surface, it turned to clay, and it would cement in the bow of the ship, and that's exactly what happened. Listen to this. It's, an, it's uh, amazing how true God's word is. So after the 14th night, we just talked about, they had been driven across the sea. They took a sound. They suspected that they were <clears throat> around a land. Smith found that <clears throat> they're at the point here is a, is a big mountain and a lot of rocks, and you can hear the waves crashing miles away. They were in the dark, remember? They suspect they were near because they probably heard the waves. They took a sounding and they said, yep, we're getting near land. They put in the anchor so that they would, um, uh, in verse 29, they put down the anchors and they waited until morning. And Paul foiled a plan for the sailors to escape. They were going to put the lifeboat down. So, oh, we got to put some anchors in the front. Well, if you know anything about sailing, the anchors are holding the boat. Anchors in the front aren't going to do a thing. But they were going to steal away and take the lifeboat and save themselves. Paul had the centurion cut that boat loose. It went away with nobody in it. And so when the next day came, Paul said, everybody eat, get ready. And all 276 persons in the ship, and when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship, threw all the wheat out into the sea. Then they cut the ropes and hoisted the foresail. That's the little sail in the front. So they cut the ropes, and that little sail pulled them towards the island. They ran into that, um, uh, into that reef that I just talked about, and listen to this. The bow stuck and was Im immovable. Well, that's the exact reef that Smith had found that worked its way from sand, because, you know, if you're on the sand, it's wishy-washy. It's stuck in clay. I mean, it's amazing. And so the surf broke up the back of the boat. They all jumped off the front of the boat. 
They were going to kill all the prisoners. The Roman guy, the centurion said, no way, um, because he liked Paul, and so that saved all the prisoners' lives. And everybody who could swim jumped overboard. If you couldn't swim, they gave you a piece of wood. You jumped overboard with a piece of wood. That was like a uh, life jacket back in those days. And here it is, the final verse. And so it was, all were brought safely to land. Can you imagine being in a hurricane and a storm, not knowing where you are, but delivered, and you're safe on a sandy beach? Amazing. And this is exactly how it works. God's Word is so true that every part of this has been shown to be accurate. So as we close, not every shipwreck ends with rejoicing. There was an airplane wreck, which is, we don't, we don't take ships across the ocean very much anymore, but we take a lot of airplanes. And there was a wreck in 1982. It was so tragic, I actually witnessed it with my very eyes as this happened. There was a plane that took off in, in, in Washington, D.C., January 13th, 1982. 74 people on, on the ship, on the, on the airplane. I uh, won't get into the, in the long part of the story, but pilot error had ice. They did some stupid things in their checklist. It just makes me crazy. They turned off the switch that would have heated the jet engines and kept them from freezing. Anyway. This plane went up, never got over 50 feet in the air, crashed on the Memorial Bridge, which is now named the Arlen Williams Bridge, for a man that saved a bunch of people, a few people, and, and into the icy waters of the Potomac. Out of all of those passengers, only five people were able to cut loose and to get up to the surface. Arlen Williams was one of them, but he had some... Um, straps on him that kind of caught him in the, in the tail fin, which was sitting up out of the water. Four other people were around him. Finally, helicopters started coming with life ropes. Arlen helped uh, one person. Then a couple, he got two of them on the next life rope. So he got four people out. It was for his turn to be saved. Well, you know, the end of the story, the, the, the tail tilted, Pulled him under. He was dying anyway. He couldn't have survived. Arlen died. He was a believer. He truly believed in giving his life up for others. And because of that Christian who was doing the right thing that the Lord led him, that gut instinct he felt, I don't want to save myself. I want to help this woman. I want to help this injured man. I want to help these two people. He gave his life. And I watched that on TV, and it haunts me still. I see him bobbing up and, 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 and pushing it away from him and helping to get the other people on that, on, in their uh, little rings they lowered down for them to climb into to pull them over the shore. And then I saw him go under never to survive. That is what God calls us to do in our lives. We don't know. Every day you wake up, you may have an opportunity to save somebody. You, heaven forbid, you may have be in a situation like Arlen Williams was. I pray not, but you might be. But every day you will run into people whose lives you can save in a more important way. Their spiritual life, they are lost. They are dying. Just like those other people in that frozen Potomac River, they're they are gasping for life, physical life. But there are many that are gasping for life spiritually. And you need, and I need, to wake up and be aware and to realize that in these stormy times, I can save a life. Physically, I might, but spiritually, I can also. And that is what the Lord shows so beautifully here. Through Paul, his faithfulness, 
He saved 276 people physically. And then his witness to them 